Hello, Peter. Hello, how are you today, Yale? Yeah? I'm excellent. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. Um, you're joining us from New Zealand. It's even, <laughs> it's even, it's even more exciting. Um, please, Peter, tell us a bit more about yourself. So, um, as you've said, I live in New Zealand, uh, but I work globally. I work in the area of governance and, and helping boards govern well. You know, we're living in a world that's uh, quite turbulent at the moment. Uh, and many boards have started to become a little bit confused about um, their role in, in, their, um, in the companies they govern. So for the last 20 years, uh, I've served as company director on various New Zealand-based businesses. Uh, and, and I also do advisory and education work with boards, regulators and, uh, and across civil society um, on five continents now. Um, the only one not is South America. And uh, once the pandemic is over and we're able to travel again now, which is almost now, uh, I'll be able to respond to some of those inquiries in person again. So it's a PhD in uh, corporate governance and strategy as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, it's impressive. Um, we, we had several conversations with our colleagues over the past couple of months since, since we since we met online and you know we've been chatting about the reality and the situation and current situations going on around the world and how it, it mm. impacts uh, the board members and and overall you know the company and the growth and the, and the lack of productivity and and I'm curious uh, you, you said that it's been 20 years what has been done before that is not today um, visible to the board members? What are the types of efforts um, that should have been provided that we didn't? Yeah, so, so I think that um, th there's a couple of things in there. I think that um, historically, and let's say before year 2000, as a generalization, let's just put that as a marker. Yeah. Um, when, when I became involved in boards at that time, I'd already had 15 years commercial experience and various technology innovation leadership roles in both domestic New Zealand businesses, but also multinationals. And um, one of the things that started to change around about the turn of the century is the expectation of shareholders um, for, for business performance shifted. Uh, previously, that expectation lay uh, and the accountability lay with the chief executive. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that the board of directors met, mm. uh, they talked about whatever they talked about, uh, and they rubber stamped some decisions to support their chief executive. Uh, and that was reasonably normal. There were variations on that in different countries around the world, but that was reasonably normal transmission yeah. through that period. Um, however, from about 2000, what people um, started doing, and we're talking about the media, um, government regulators, uh, academics, others, uh, they started to realise that um, uh, there was more to it. And, and they started looking uh, two boards of directors to start to fulfill their accountability. So in law, um, the ultimate responsibility uh, for the company lies with the board. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so they were starting to be held to account. And also there were uh, many examples starting to become visible yep. uh, even before the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. of serious missteps or company failures. And some of these inquiries, for example, the Cadbury uh, inquiry in, uh, in the UK in the early 90s, so about a decade before, um, refined uh, the terminology corporate governance. That was a term that had only first been invented in 1960, and, and it wasn't used even in company annual reports, even to 2000. People would talk about directors, um, a directing or directorship, whereas now we talk about governance all the time. Uh, yeah. and, and so you can just see there's that evolutionary change um, from meeting and signing off the chief executive to taking that role of governance much more seriously. But with that, 
there's a there's another piece which um, we can understand quite easily uh, if we think about that timeline and compare it to other disciplines, for example, medicine or accountancy, yeah. uh, which which might have survived for hundreds of years. And so uh, to be a company director in most Western um, countries, but also some Middle Eastern and others, uh, you simply need to be above a certain age and not be breaking the law at the moment. You don't even need to be trained. So, um, you know, a cynical view is you need to be warm and breathing in New Zealand above 18 years old and not before the courts at the moment, and you can be a company director. That's a huge responsibility to place on the shoulders of a man or a woman. Uh, and whereas if you want to be a doctor, you've got to be trained in university, trained in hospitals, then specialised. Uh, but it means that we can rely on doctors. The difficulty we've got is that there are many well-intentioned directors, but we can't rely on all of them to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So there's just some of that evolutionary change. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for, for highlighting that because uh, it seems that it's not well known because there are practices, diverse views, diverse opinion. And, and it leads us to, to the fact that the corporate responsibility has been literally changed. And today we're trying to adapt the, what we call ESGs. Mm -hmm trying to extend as possible the, the, the question and, 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 and you know, the, the, the line between uh, ESGs, corporate responsibility, governance, direction, uh, goals, everything seems to be so blurred. And we hear, uh, you know, we're together on, on, on the diverse forums and, and conversation, um, mm -hmm. you know, all, all over the, the social media platforms. And, and, and it seems that we are, um, not capable to recognize the patterns that we need today to lead the way towards um, a better status and to elevate the way towards, you know, mm. sustainable mm. purposes. Mm. Mm. What, what, do you, what do we need to do here? Okay, so the first thing we need to do is you and I need to agree, and I think we do, I'm absolutely agreeing with what it is you're saying, that we've got a mess you know, and to say that it's all beautiful and laid out like some beautiful Portuguese tiles on the blue tiles on the side of the buildings is just wrong. It's not like that. It's a mess. Uh, and and um, uh, in fact, the three, the questions that I get asked most often from boards and, and, uh, and, and um, they ask me privately because they're kind of embarrassed to ask. Uh, they are these. Um, what is the role of the board? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is corporate governance? And how should it be practiced? Now, you might say they're simple questions, and I would agree. You might say they're basic questions, and I would agree. So why are they being asked? They're being asked for exactly the reasons sitting underneath the symptoms. And I think what you've described is a series of symptoms, not root causes, symptoms. So uh, we've got companies doing the wrong thing, mm -hmm. which, um, which might end up in the failure of the company or, or some tragedy in the marketplace or erosion of shareholder capital or, or whatever. Uh, we've got some incredibly well-meaning companies that are doing good things, but they're not so many. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we've got consultants, directors, institutes, regulators and others who are all forming opinions as to how governance should be practiced. And so the starting point is that um, many of them are claiming that they've got the best practice. And that's fine, except when I talk with Director Institute A in a country, and then talk to a business consulting firm B in the same country, so same law, uh, they they'll tell me quite different understandings of best practice. So that starts to raise some rather unusual questions about, well, if this is best and this is best and they're different, which one? So to think that there is a single best way of boards doing their job is, is, is futile. It's not going to give you a good answer. 
But what we can say about board work is there are some principles at the high level which are static, which are stable, and they have been for over 2,000 years since the Greeks invented the word kybernetes, from which we get our English translation, governance. And that is the, you know, the, the to steer, to guide, to pilot. So the role of the board governance lies with the board. Oh, and it's to steer, steer the organization and guide the organization to a future. Mm. Okay. Um, and, and with that, um, uh, we then have many, many others that say, well, we should do it this way, we should do it that way. And, and uh, in relation to CSR, um, that was in response to some companies doing the wrong thing. And now we've got ESG. It's a grab bag bucket because people are saying uh, since about 2005, we need to measure and report corporate performance in a different way so that investors can learn about how that company is performing. Now, that's fine if that company is public listed, but what about private companies? Uh, and and um, what about economic performance? Because ES, environmental and social, does not include finance. And G is governance, and that's something that happens inside companies, although many people apply a different definition to that. So I'm agreeing with you strongly that we've got a mess. And the reason we've got a mess is because our basic definitions have not been agreed. Uh, and then we've got consultants, academics, and others uh, who are adding layers onto what is a weak foundation. But most people are well-intentioned and some don't recognize it for the problem that it is. Interesting. It's an interesting perspective because, um, and, and thank you for, for this, because, you know, I, I rarely get the answers so precise around what governance and how it is driven, uh, you know, at right. okay. level. So excellent. Uh, and, and thank you for that, Peter. Um, you spoke about responsibility and accountability earlier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we see a lot of governments uh, activists, uh, journalists, um, talking about holding uh, companies account for the uh, social impact. Um, yeah. You know, we saw that during COP26, probably we're going to see yeah. it during the upcoming events um, around, you know, the globe. And I'm trying, you know, from my little perspective to, to, to explain for, to, to explore as much as possible through the road to sustainability and my diverse mm -hmm. activities mm -hmm. and, and, and my startup. Um, how do we implement um, properly the decision made uh, from the above to yeah. something that is going to be much more practical? Um, and it's difficult. And, and yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and so I think the first thing we need to recognize here is that a board exists only uh, inside a company. It doesn't exist by itself, okay? So it exists in a company and a company requires the marketplace for the company to exist. And then you, the wider out the society, it's like the layers of an onion, isn't it? And, and, and so uh, the company uses resources, and those might be, you know, natural resources, so environmental, ecological, uh, people, um, whether it's brain power or manual working or whatever, administration, uh, and financial resources, economic, so so S E E, and uh, and having consumed those resources or use those resources about uh, the conduct of business, um, the company leaves behind um, a footprint. And, and that footprint has, has all three of those capital elements as well. And it's useful to measure uh, that, that across. Now, in terms of um, governments, activists, are there uh, many, many of these groups, and I'm not gonna take a position on any particular group because I don't think that's helpful for the conversation. So let me speak more generally. Um, many of these groups, uh, um, have, a, have a particular view, um, quite often it's ideologically driven, sometimes it's not, uh, 
and and um, their perspective is that um, companies are making too much money, that there's too much inequality between people at the top end of society and the bottom end of society, and, and there's a degree of rebellion. Um, we have many, many experiences of the, through the life of human history, and usually when there's too much discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots, it's, it's resolved ultimately because we fight, and, and it's wars. And, and Putin and Ukraine is an example at the moment, but there are many, many other examples, and the two big world wars are probably the most extreme of those yeah. examples. Yeah. Um, but, but the 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 question that needs to be asked in here, and I think that the reason we've got this activist uprising is, is fair and reasonable because boards and companies are perhaps being a bit selfish and introspective in some cases. And so if we think about um, the big groups in society, we've got the government, business, and civil society. And the government's about rules and infrastructure. Civil society is about our community infrastructure, yeah. schools, other, religion, uh, and business is about economic. Mm -hmm. Now, if each of those pieces are doing their pieces well, then the interactions will be rich and we'll be able to go forward. The difficulty we've got is answering the question, what happens if one of them does not pull their weight properly? And what happens if one of them decides to take over or to um, you know, step into the area that's a different area. So for example, governments starting to take on business themselves by nationalizing certain activities. Um, and and this, is, this is where the disagreements arise. And, and so I think it is fair to say that um, uh, some of these activists are well-founded because they're reacting against, for example, in America, the, the Friedman Doctrine 1970. Um, others of these activists are just anti-business from an ideological point of view. So, um, you know, it's messy. It's really messy. And it's unhelpful because what it does is it moves, it moves governments to consider changes to regulations and statutes and to impose new regulations and new statutes on the basis of what is sometimes weak assumptions and sometimes strong assumptions. But the consequence of which is every time we get more regulation, we ask the company to work harder to comply with those regulations. And that means there's less time and less resource available to do what the company is actually there for, which is to, which is to pursue its own purpose uh, and to create value uh, for shareholders, stakeholders, and into society. So um, I've formed the opinion uh, that we should have less regulation, not more. We should have flexibility around reporting, and and um, and and I'm probably an outlier with that, because directors are getting bombarded. Consider a couple of statistics that I read in a report recently. Um, this is a report published. I can get you the details. Eight eight out of ten, eighty percent of chief executives think their sustainability efforts are above average. They would rate themselves above average. Which is kind of interesting because average is halfway. So I wonder what the other 80%, and you can see immediately it doesn't add up to 100. So Dunning Kruger, that effect where we overstate, um, is, is plainly visible in that statistic. Yet only 36% of companies measure or have tools to measure their sustainability activities. And only half of that 36% use the data from those tools to inform their sustainability decision-making. So clearly there's some massive discrepancies in here. Uh, and and two-thirds of companies now admit to greenwashing. Uh, um, and are they greenwashing because, uh, well, you know, what's going on? It could be that they're saying, uh, we're, doing, we're doing this green stuff because uh, we need to, because the investors want us to. Right. right. Um, or it could be um, we we um, we don't believe in it because it doesn't make any difference to the economic and sustainable financial 
and non-financial performance of the business. Um, and, and so there needs to be some very adult conversations here, um, probably at the company board table and shareholder level. I don't think I don't think the United Nations or the World Economic Forum or Davos, I don't think they've got anything to say in this because their role is government and civil society. Um, and the intersections between those big blocks. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It's complicated. I'm sorry I haven't got black and white answers for you. No, no, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't expect from you. And thank you, Peter, because uh, it, 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 show, it shows up uh, on one side, you know, uh, it's been a while already that I'm in the, in, in the field uh, and focusing on sustainability, but more particularly for the past couple of years. And I see numbers, I see a lot of conversation, I read a lot of conversations and, and I'm involved in many, many uh, um, initiatives as mentioned. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we are in the, in the middle of um, what I would call um, a global crisis that ever worse of our lifetime. We don't know any, any other uh, crisis. Yet. Agree, agree, yep. And the reality is that uh, ultimately we see that in real lifetime. Uh, mm. what's happening. It, it does impact us on our, our decision making. It does impact the systems around us. It does impact, you know, the whole ecosystems um, and, and the stability of this ecosystem. And I wrote about it a couple of weeks ago. And my point here yeah. is to, to try to not to get answers that are black or white or yes, no, um, no. about no. the future of our world. It's much more about uh, the issue here that was uh, highlighted um, many, many times uh, with in, in other episodes um, is the fact that we're, talk we're talking about buzzwords, you know, with the ESGs, um, governance, oh, yeah. the, you know, open governance um, is, is, uh, is, is for the next question. But um, I, I, I don't see enough perspectives, uh, although, you know, we're trying to build from the ground up new frameworks and new models and mm. my point here is really to be uh clear about the mess that's going on although you know the issb tried you know to put a lexicon and, and to and to yeah. create something but i don't see that happening uh from the corporate perspective i don't see you know anything but we we do need you know that part of greenwashing because you know you're going to have all shades, all colors in greenwashing. Um, we need that bunch of, of, green, uh, of, of greenwashing. But what you're trying to say and that I understand is that if we don't have the, those frameworks, if we don't have you know, the uh, beginning of, of the lines and the direction that we need to undertake you know, for, the, for, the next, for, the, for the next step, uh, it's gonna be uh, all on, on the board side. And, and my question yeah. to you is, is uh, you know, shareholders do have their bunch of uh, responsibilities. Um, and we heard um, Larry Spring, uh, Warren Buffett talking about, you know, yeah. responsibility. What the small director or leader or, uh, you know, of a, com of a small company need to know today and how board members can help him uh, to step up? Mm. That's a really, really good question because what you've done is you've exposed the potential for difference between the big corporate um, companies and the institutional investors, which are, um, you know, many trillions of funds under management, right? Huge, huge. Um, we have numbers, about 46 trillion. Dollar. Yeah, I, I read globally or something like that. Yeah, I read it. It's a huge number. And, and um, but it's only a small number of companies and it's a small number of, of um, institutional investors. And um, their role in society um, is fascinating because they've become more influential over time uh, because they're able to um, buy shares in these companies, invest in their companies. Right because people like you and me, mum and dad investors, uh, put money into their funds. Mm. And so on one hand, they want to get bigger and make a profit. Uh, but on the other hand, they need to appeal and look attractive to their 
right. uh, customers, if you will, which are the right. mum and dad investors. So that's them. And, and um, interesting that over time, many of those um, index funds have, have performed at exactly the same level as the, the share market, right? So for all of their bluff and bravado, um, are they, are they doing anything special? Um, I think the main thing they're doing special is they're influencing society through what they say, but not necessarily um, for society's good, but perhaps for their own good. Now, that's a bit cynical, but just hold that. To your point, though, the smaller businesses, particularly the privately held businesses, um, this is where I do a lot of my work. You know, all of my board experiences and privately held businesses, including multi-generational family businesses, I get this space and I don't say that to be arrogant, but I have a good understanding. New Zealand, Australia, UK, across EU, Eastern Europe, India, Singapore, North America. So, you know, a diverse perspective. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, my comments to founders, to entrepreneurs, to, to board members is they need to invest time to understand what governance is. We've talked about what that is um, earlier in the conversation. The second thing, they need to be prepared uh, to be really, really clear on the aspiration. So what is the purpose of this company? What is the reason for its existence? That can be anything they like, right? But they need to be clear because that provides the foundation stone for the intention, not aspiration, intention, which is strategy. What do we want to achieve? You know, how are we going to achieve it? We intend to achieve X. And then we need to have a feedback loop to help us to check whether we're doing the right things based on what's happening in the marketplace, because directors can't build the stuff without understanding or by ignoring the marketplace. And yes, these market forces that you talk about are clear and present. And then once those intentions are done, we need to make sure that the management is acting on those actions correctly. And that the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve if we're a farming business, excellent quality cheese and milk products, for example. Mm. Um, if, if, if we're a roading company, that the road is constructed in a safe manner so people can drive their trucks and cars easily and safely on yeah. the road, doesn't matter what it is, um, that we actually check back and make sure that the outcomes that we expected when we signed off that project are actually delivered in practice. And that matches back to societal expectations, customer expectations, supplier expectations. So boards need to understand that their role is not to run the company, that the chief executive works for the board, not the other way around. Right. Uh, and, and that um, the role of the director is quite different. It's big picture. Uh, they need to be able to be comfortable with ambiguity and that the board best assembled and most effective is not necessarily a board that looks diverse, uh, but it's a board that has capabilities in terms of sector knowledge, um, technical expertise, for example, cyber or, or lawyer or accountant, whatever's relevant for that yeah. business. Maturity and wisdom, teamwork, uh, and then does certain things like set strategy, um, make sure we've got purpose under control, internal policies, monitoring performance, holding management to account for strategy implementation, and then providing accountability and reporting to shareholders yeah. and legitimate stakeholders, of course. Uh, and, then, and then they're displaying the behaviours that are relevant for good teamwork, vigorous debate, and good decision-making. And, and, and if, boards, if boards can start to wrestle with that rather than take cookie cutters off the shelf and say, here's TCFD reporting, here's, um, here's IIRC, here's GRI, here's this, here's that, that ends up reducing very, very quickly to a tick box mentality um, based on a whole bunch of assumptions that it's important and relevant. Mm -hmm. To the board, it may not be important and relevant, but to the external stakeholders it might be well, and, and so this this uh, there's a lot going on yeah indeed well uh wow peter that's precious and i'm sure that the audience is gonna 
appreciate your your experience and, and and feedback from what's going on in and i absolutely loved it and and i look forward to to having another episode with you uh because it's it's so um it's so precise and it's it's full of it's full of gems and 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 i'm sure that we're gonna uh open up more Pandora boxes because it's excellent. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you very much, Al. It's, it's been a delight to spend some time with you. And uh, if, if others have got questions, I'm sure they can contact you or me and we can follow up with that at a later time. Perhaps also audience may wish to put proposals for new topics and um, I'm sure they can be considered as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate.